Brother Michael's message today comes from Psalms chapter 126. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Amen. Thank you, Sister Logan. <clears throat> I've chosen this 126th Psalm as a, I guess it's the best way of saying what I have to say this morning. I'm not necessarily going to expound this Psalm. I hope that's, a, that's ex an acceptable practice. I don't intend to do this a lot. <clears throat> but I want to, uh, I had wanted to have a, a main text to refer to and uh, <clears throat> to, to state what I have to say, <clears throat> oh, what I have to say is in the scripture. I'm not just making something up and trying to find something in the Bible to go along with it. I hope you understand. But <clears throat> this is uh, the fifth message in the series of the fall of Babylon. <clears throat> I think a couple of people asked me recently how many I had preached so far, and I told them three. I'd, I'd lost track myself. That's pretty bad, and you lose track of your own sermon series, but... This is the fifth. I've preached four <clears throat> before this. And uh, at this, this section, what we're looking at is things that happened during the captivity <clears throat> recorded in Scripture. And in particular, uh, the title of my message this morning is The Saints Preserved. The, one of the lessons associated with the Babylonian captivity is that we can't put everyone during this time, during this judgment, we can't put everyone in the same category in this, in this judgment. <clears throat> and this is true with many of God's judgments. When Nebuchadnezzar's army came and besieged Jerusalem, not everyone that lived in Jerusalem was wicked. Not every person there had forsaken God. <clears throat> Yet all were adversely affected by this judgment. If God's judgments are perceived only from man's lower point of view, then they, this can become very complicated and confusing to us. When you start asking questions like, well, people ask today, why do good things or bad things happen to good people? Why did this happen to me, and why did that happen to him? Well, these are, these are from the lower point of view, and we look at God's judgments from his point of view and understand why his judgments come and what he is doing, then a lot of the these complications and confusion are cleared up. <clears throat> Therefore, we want to look at the Babylonian captivity from the highest point of view. This is, we want to look at it from God's big picture. And it's his picture. He's the one painting the picture, so we want to see it from his point of view. And in our own time, spiritual Babylon dominates the world. Religion has become saturated with the Babylonian spirit and culture. Everywhere in the world where the word of God has been preached, this spirit of Babylon has been there also. It's been there and working. I've said this before and I'll say again, my personal conviction is that every single person in our time who makes a profession of faith, of faith must be confronted with this Babylonian spirit. They, it's they must be confronted with it. This is a test. It's inescapable. This is something that now has covered the globe. We're, we're talking about a judgment of God now. This is like the flood. It covered the face of the earth. This is this Babylonian spirit now has covered the face of the earth so that it is, it's not avoidable. Anyone who press, professes faith is going to have to confront this because it's a, that kind of a judgment. The parallel to the present day spiritual, spiritual Babylon is seen in <clears throat> ancient Babylon where God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to judge his people in Judah and Jerusalem and also some other nations too. This was not a judgment on individual persons or a judgment on families but on nations. 
that transgressed against God. So if you were one of the persons living in one of those nations, this judgment came to your doorstep, no matter if you lived for the Lord or not, it, you were affected by this at that time. <clears throat> to some extent, everyone experienced the wrath and cruelty of Nebuchadnezzar to some degree, whether you believed in God or not. But God is merciful to his people. <clears throat> And in his wrath, he remembers his mercy. He delivers in mercy. He pardons because of his mercy. He has mercy on his afflicted, and his mercy endureth forever. His mercies are very great and manifold and tender, and he saves us because of his mercy and blots out our transgressions according to his mercy. The Lord has a multitude of mercies, and he is the God of mercies. So the people of God are never on the same level as the wicked. Even when these, I'm going to call them sweeping judgments that cover the earth, even though it comes to everyone, still in that judgment, the people of God are not on the same level as the wicked. They're not viewed by God as being the same as the wicked. Although these judgments come, <clears throat> there is still a distinction made in heaven between the elect and the condemned. But from our lower point of view, sometimes it doesn't appear obvious. This is something, again, perceived by faith. <clears throat> In these sweeping judgments that God sends upon the earth, although his people are affected, he knows each one of us and remembers us and is merciful to us in the judgment. And this, too, is seen in the ancient Babylonian captivity as well as the present time. <clears throat> For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth his rain on the just and the unjust. Not only is there pleasant and needed rain for all from the Father, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But now tribulation is not only for them, Paul and Barnabas taught the disciples that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And Paul wrote, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the particular, in the present time, we should remember who is he that condemneth. It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, also making intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? We well, you know the rest of the text there, the answer is nay. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. So, so to say that everything bad comes from the devil... And everything that is good comes from God is way too simplistic of an explanation. It's just, it's just not that simple. It's not that easy and uncomplicated. <clears throat> not so easily explained. There is a lot that God is doing through the means of spiritual Babylon. For one thing, it is a judgment on the churches. <clears throat> just as ancient Babylon was a judgment on Judah. God has made a tremendous investment in his people. So if they will not serve him, he will make them serve another. <clears throat> and God will be justified in condemning them. Paul put it this way, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the coming of Babylon was not just something that happened by coincidence. It was because of a departure from God. It was a judgment from God that came on all the people in his land. <clears throat> Unlike the destruction of the temple, and Jerusalem by the Romans, which Jesus warned his disciples about. <clears throat> no escape from Babylonian captivity was offered to anyone. <clears throat> Kings were taken, princes were taken, 
holy prophets were taken, old and young, male and female, rich and poor, servant and master, every person in Jerusalem and in the land of Judah was affected adversely by the Babylonian captivity. <clears throat> what Babylon did was not like what the Romans did to the Jews. Jesus told his disciples about what to look for when the Romans were going to come and destroy the city. And to, he warned them of it, but no such things were told to the people of Judah before the Babylonians came. Now the prophets did foretell what would happen, but no one was told how to escape from it or how it could be avoided. <clears throat> The Babylonian captivity was very different from the bondage in Egypt. Although they did have children in Babylon, and the prophet told them, hey, build houses and settle in and have children when you go into captivity because you're going to be there. You're going to be there for a while. But they did not multiply like they did in Egypt. God did not hear their groanings like he did when they were in Egypt. And he did not deliver them from the captivity until Babylon fell. In a way, no one was delivered from Babylon. They had to survive it. They had to last until Babylon fell. Again, Daniel is the most excellent example of this. He stood strong in the faith where the Lord planted him, and he simply outlived Babylon. He endured longer than four or five heathen kings, but no one was free from the Babylonian rule and influence until Babylon fell and came to an end. No one returned to Jerusalem until Cyrus the Persian made a decree to return and build a temple. Consider this truth that nothing was restored under Babylonian rule. <clears throat> I'm not going to, you can just take that and go wherever you want with it, but that's just the truth. Nothing was restored under the Babylonian rule. Everything was plundered and taken to Babylon for Babylon. No captives were released to return to their own countries during Babylon's reign. It's God's design in this judgment that his people be confronted with Babylon. <clears throat> Babylon's been given a great deal of influence over the thinking of religious men. It influenced all of us to some degree. <clears throat> we have often confessed that we had to unlearn things that we were taught, particularly regarding the scriptures. We developed wrong perceptions and wrong impressions about the kingdom of God in Babylon. However, even when we were in Babylon, we could not receive the things that were there. There was much of it, nearly all of it, that was abrasive to our spirits. We knew God was not pleased with the things that we saw and that we heard there. This distinguishes believers who are in Babylon from those who Paul just described as receiving not the love of the truth. Those who love the truth will outlast Babylon. But those who do not have been judged by God already. How have they been judged? God sent this great delusion in Babylon. It was exactly what some wanted and what some were looking for. So they bought it up. They joined themselves to the snare that God had set for their wayward hearts. Now they embrace the lies taught in Babylon such as that evangelism is the most important thing, or some just teach that it's the only thing, or that friendship with the world is good, and that sin is all right with God, and that his word is open to democratic interpretations of men, and that in effect that Jesus isn't really all that important. People who give themselves to this kind of spirit are not innocent. This trap was set for them just for those who have not received the love of the truth. Believers will not fall into this snare. Believers will not be taken up unto this judgment. Even though it's all around us, we will not be deceived by it. Many of us have testified that we were in the middle of it, <clears throat> in the thick of the battle at times, and even though we were physically there in it, <clears throat> our hearts were not there. Our spirits could not receive the things that were being offered, like Daniel and Azariah and Hanani and Mishael, we refuse the king's meat. Yeah. Under no circumstances would we bow down and worship their golden image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. 
If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now some of us have said the same thing, we're not going to buy your books. We're not going to preach what you want to hear. We are not going to give our money to your building project. We are not going to teach your curriculum in our classes. We are not going to embrace the garbage you are teaching and preaching. We are not going to contribute to, nor condone, nor cooperate in any way with your perversion of our Lord's truth. We will not make ourselves the enemies of God for your sakes. Babylon is a judgment that affects the people of God, yet they are preserved through it. <clears throat> Some of us left on our own, others of us were asked to leave, but none of us can say that Babylon has had no effect on us. That's because, again, this is a worldwide sweeping judgment of God. <clears throat> Another thing that God is doing in Babylon, <clears throat> in this Babylonian judgment, I should say, <clears throat> is proving the superiority of the faith of his people. Because the faith is in Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, faith, like its object, is indomitable. It cannot be conquered as long as it is possessed. It cannot be subdued by any evil power. Faith always wins. Amen. I love the way Brother Paul says this in Romans 14, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So what is the worst thing that our enemy can do to us? He can make you live a life of suffering and tribulation for the sake of righteousness. Well, if I live, I live unto the Lord, and the Lord's merciful. Perhaps the taking of your life may be the worst thing. Well, in our deaths, we are yet the Lord's, and it will be but a sweet and eternal rest with him. Amen. No one thing and no, no, no one and no thing can dominate the faith of God's elect. Even the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, we don't desire to have dominion over your faith. That's not the reason for this, for these corrections, that, these things that we're telling you, we're not trying to dominate your faith, we want to add to your joy. <clears throat> Helpers of your joy. If anyone has been dominated by Babylon, it's because they lack faith. Now I'm talking about the faith, not some generalized, ambiguous religious term as it's commonly used today. This is the faith spoken of in Scripture, the faith of God's elect, the faith of Jesus, the faith of God, the faith of our father Abraham, the faith of the Son of God the faith of the gospel, and the faith of the saints. This is the faith that came when Jesus gave it to us. It is the faith by which every just man lives unto God, and the faith that is counted for righteousness. It's the faith that overcomes the world, including the judgment of Babylon. Amen. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Amen. Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> in the Babylonian judgment, this is another thing that God is doing in this, he's going to show off his people. Right. Not only will those who do not love the truth be deceived, but those who do love the truth are going to be like a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. It doesn't matter how many people lived in the Babylonian kingdom or how many different gods they had, or how many heathen temples were built. It didn't matter how many different cultures had been brought in and blended into the Babylonian society. They couldn't hide people like Daniel. Babylon's wise men, their magicians and astrologers were known throughout the world for their abilities, but the wisdom that God gave Daniel was superior, made them look like fools. Not only did he interpret the king's dream, but first he told him what he dreamed. Daniel was also given to see visions concerning the four great kingdoms that would come upon the earth and even the coming of the Savior up until the end of time. 
he was made ruler second only to Nebuchadnezzar. And later on in kingdoms, he was made ruler over the 120 provinces of the Medes and Persians. During the reign of King Darius, it is said of Daniel, Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Well, I'm pointing out here, this is during the captivity. This is during the reign of the cruel Nebuchadnezzar. And, well, actually, this was shortly after that, but that's when Daniel started, was during this reign of Babylon. All of this was done beginning when Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel captive to Babylon. So he's an excellent example of the superiority of the faith of God's elect in the midst of a heathen and ungodly culture. <clears throat> there was no compromise in him, no blending, no corruption, yet he excelled to the highest favor among kings that ruled the earth, but even more so in heaven, being greeted by an angel as O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Whether under the Old Covenant or New Covenant, Jerusalem or Babylon, peacetime or tribulation, free or captive, faith overcomes and glorifies God. And God is proving this to be true by the use of Babylon. Faith is superior at all times and in all circumstances, even in times of judgment. Your faith in God will keep you out of personal trouble, but that's no guarantee that you won't experience tribulation. <clears throat> Yet trouble will come to people with faith. He still chastens every son whom he receives. And there are times of mass judgment like the Babylonian captivity in which the faith of the people of God may not keep them out of trouble, but it will preserve them through it. <clears throat> the same time that Babylon's being used to show the insincere and the hypocrites, God is also showing his ability to preserve his people and deliver them in the same environment. <clears throat> I want us to give some consideration to some of the means that God uses to keep the feet of his saints in times like this. <clears throat> At the outset of the Babylonian judgment, it appeared as though no one could survive and be saved through this. <clears throat> the Babylonians were, as the prophet Habakkuk foretold, for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from afar. They shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as sand. They shall scoff at kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold. They shall heap dust and take it. Now you can read from Jeremiah's Lamentations <clears throat> what the city of Jerusalem appeared like during the siege. And it might appear from that that it looks like Judah's coming to an end. Like, who could survive this? This is more terrible than we could have imagined. <clears throat> who could escape such cruelty? How could any people who were not born in Babylon survive in Babylon? And especially after 70 years in Babylon. The same kind of spiritual evil rules in our time. How can anyone escape such worldwide perversion and such a powerful influence? Every time we meet a person who professes to be a believer, I confess I'm a little suspicious. I don't want to be, I don't like this, that these thoughts run through my mind, but it's because this environment that we live in. We don't know. You meet a brother or sister somewhere and, and you think, well, have they bought into Babylon or have they already passed the test? I don't know. Let's talk and s'more. Let's see, let's find out what they know. This is the kind of environment we're in. We don't like this. We don't like it that these thoughts run through our minds and that but we're not trying to judge anyone or that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm describing the environment that dominates our day. <clears throat> but the Lord's able to preserve his people and he will preserve his people. Amen. By faith we know that this is not an impossible situation for God. We have our examples in the scriptures. 
which of the saints could not testify of God's power to preserve and deliver them from seemingly impossible circumstances. Jeremiah prophesied prior to and into the coming of the Babylonians, and he could tell us no matter what they did to me, or how many times, that, that's my own people, or how many times they rejected my word, they couldn't shut my mouth, and they couldn't stop my pen. For I heard the defaming of many, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report. All my familiars watched for my halting, saying, peradventure, he'll be enticed, and we shall prevail against him, and we shall take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, terrible one. Therefore, my persecutors shall stumble, and they shall not prevail. They shall be greatly ashamed, for they shall not prosper. Their everlasting confusion shall never be forgotten. Sing unto the Lord, praise ye the Lord, for he hath delivered the soul of the poor from the hand of evildoers. That's what Jeremiah said. Amen. Now he was taken to Egypt with those who thought they were going to escape the Babylonians. <clears throat> and after about two years in Egypt, his own people stoned Jeremiah. Ezekiel went captive to Babylon and prophesied there for many years, I believe at least 12 years, again to hard-hearted people. And the Lord told him, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house." So in this situation, God strengthened Ezekiel for what God had used him for. There is no other way to account for his endurance and the things that he suffered as one of God's holy prophets, such as lying on his side prophesying for 390 days, eating bread mixed with dung, and the Lord taking his wife in the ninth year of the captivity and then told him, don't mourn over her, at least not in public, just just go on and act like nothing ever happened when your wife dies. And this is one of God's holy prophets. He endured in this judgment by the grace of God. <clears throat> then, of course, Daniel and Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. <clears throat> These three uh, latter friends of Daniel were all noted for their faith in Babylon, being cast into the fiery furnace because they refused to worship the golden image, but they were delivered without so much of the smell of smoke on them. Daniel was conspired against and thrown into the lion's den, from which he was delivered without a scratch. Daniel especially endured in faith, outlasting Babylon, living to be used of God throughout the rule of five heathen kings. What wonderful things were shown to Daniel while in Babylon. Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, Zerubbabel, Joshua the priest, Nehemiah, all of these were likely born in Babylon and lived to return to Jerusalem to restore the city and the temple, to build the wall, and especially Nehemiah and Ezra worked on restoring the service to God. You read their books and you'll find that's the main thrust, the temple, the priesthood, serving God. Let's get this back in order. So not everything that happened during the Babylonian captivity was bad. That's because the Lord is in control of his own judgments. <clears throat> Now, we cannot say that all of the saints were preserved so that they could come out, because not all of them did come out. <clears throat> Some died in the captivity, not because they were unfaithful, not because they fell to the judgment, but because they accomplished what God had given them to do in their own time and in their own place. Again, we know of at least one, Daniel, who outlived the captivity, but he never returned to Judah. <clears throat> So we can't say that the saints were preserved only to rebuild the wall with Nehemiah because not all participated in that. We can't say that all the saints were preserved to rebuild the temple because not all participated in that. But all lived by faith and served God well in their own generations. And God preserved them in this time of great peril. Amen. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. 
Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now, although these did not all have the same ministry, there are things that the people of God have in common in perilous times. They kept themselves separate from their surroundings. They maintain a longing for home, for the city of God, and for the temple of God. They desire for the name of the Lord to be glorified in his land and in his people. They continued to look for his promises to be fulfilled. And even though they were in tribulation, they looked to receive more good from God. We know that the present state is not the final state of things. Those who endure through the captivity are those who have already made the separation in their hearts. <clears throat> they have already, as Peter said, escaped the corruption that is in the world and escaped the pollutions that is in the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The people who become settled and comfortable and agreeable in Babylon will not come out of her even when the opportunity is given. So then many good things happened during the Babylonian captivity not because the times were good, but because God is over all. Think of the wonderful things we gain from the writings of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai and Zechariah. All of these men lived during the captivity. <clears throat> Think of the record we have of how the Lord used Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, after the captivity was over. And Joshua, the high priest, both of these men were great contributors and helpers of the people of God in rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. At least one of the Psalms appears to have been written during the captivity. That's the 137th Psalm, and perhaps this text that Sister Logan read, the 126th Psalm, possibly. <clears throat> and think of the great decrees that the heathen kings made concerning God during this time. Nebuchadnezzar, Darius, Cyrus, Artaxerxes, Ahasuerus, all made worldwide decrees acknowledging the God of the Jews. While in Babylon, Ezekiel and Daniel had wonderful visions of the great things God was yet to do concerning the temple and the coming of the Savior and the end of the world's kingdoms and the establishment of Christ's kingdom and the coming of <clears throat> and his triumph. If it were not for Jeremiah's writings, Daniel would not know that the captivity was, were, was almost over. Yeah. Ezekiel and Daniel were both prominent during the captivity, and Ezekiel even referred to Daniel twice in his prophecy. Ezekiel 14, verse 14 and verse 20 basically say the same thing. Those, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. And to the king of Tyrus, Ezekiel delivered this sarcastic word, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. This is, Daniel lived in this time. I don't know that Ezekiel and Daniel ever saw each other, but they knew of each other. There is no secret they can hide from thee, he wrote, concerning the king of Tyrus. What God had done with Daniel... <clears throat> made him a man of greatness and fame, even while he yet lived. The depth and profoundness of the things that God gave to Daniel have yet to be fully revealed yet. And here it is over 2,000 years later. <clears throat> Just because we live in perilous times in which the Babylonian spirit dominates the world, that does not mean that God has no good things for us and no good things for us to do. The saints are preserved in perilous times because they serve God. <clears throat> and God has a purpose that he's working through his saints. <clears throat> For these reasons, the Babylonian captivity was not the end of Judah and Jerusalem. God was shown to be the God through the survival of his people. The rebuilding of the walls of his city, the rebuilding of his temple, the reestablishing of service to him in it, the repopulation, replanting, and bearing of good fruit in his land, even after the judgment that came through Babylon. In preserving his people, God is preserving his own purpose, which is going to be worked out through his people, and he's preserving his own name in the earth. Who else could rebuild the walls of the city but the people of God? Who else could rebuild the temple but God's people? You're going to let Sanballat and Tobiah handle this? <clears throat> 
Who else could bring forth the seed promised to Abraham, the Savior that was promised to come into the world? He's not going to come from Ishmael's seed or from Esau's seed. <clears throat> Likewise, in our time, what manifold wisdom of God could be shown to the principalities and powers in heavenly places if his own people are not preserved and delivered from the captivity? The church are the people through which he is showing his manifold wisdom. So if there's no church, if everything is Babylon, then his manifold wisdom cannot be seen. But there is a remnant. Even so then at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There is a people reserved that have come out from the captivity to rebuild the walls of his city and to serve him in his temple. The saints were preserved for the work of the Lord, not to be absorbed into the Babylonian culture Amen. and to spread it around. Yeah. I don't want to leave the impression that God needs us, <clears throat> but he has chosen to do these things through his people. And if we're not suitable and ready for him to use, he'll simply use someone else. Mm -hmm. The point is that we are being preserved by God because of what he has determined to do not because he can't stand to see us experience difficulty. <clears throat> so the main reason for the return of the captivity and the preservation of the people of God is for God's glory to show that God keeps his promises. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the time to favor her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones and favor the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and the kings of the earth thy glory. When the Lord shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. Amen. That's how the world knows. Yeah. This is how his manifold wisdom is openly seen. It's when the Lord builds up Zion. Babylon is going to fall, and out of the judgment, out of the captivity, out of the tribulation, out of the perilous times, the captives shall come with rejoicing, and Zion will be built up. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Amen. In these perilous times, God will keep his people. <clears throat> and they will endure to the end. Amen. Ezekiel prophesied of these things also in chapter 9. <clears throat> This is about the judgment that was to come upon Jerusalem, but it is also about the judgment that comes upon the churches in our time. Ezekiel 9, beginning at verse 4, The Lord said unto him, as to these men, these angels that appeared before the Lord, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others, he said, that's these, these other angels, he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, fill the courts, fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. This is the Lord's city. This is the, the house, is the temple we're talking about. This is where judgment will begin. It begins in the churches. <clears throat> Those who sigh and cry for all the abominations are the same ones that sow in tears, bearing precious seed. When judgment comes, they are preserved. When Babylon falls, they will be preserved. And they will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. They will come with testimonies of God's providence and of our Lord's great salvation. They will doubtless come bearing much good fruit. They belong to God, and he kept them for himself. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. Amen.